And so the first question goes to Dr. File. What is the rate of COVID-19 in children? Uh, sorry, Tom, you're on mute. Well, first of all, thank you for reminding me I was on mute. But then uh, secondly, I just want to uh, thank you and everybody on this call uh, for participating in this discussion. Because I think if we have these discussions uh, and we disseminate good information, all of us can make uh, better educated decisions about you know, our health uh, and lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is a very important question. Quite honestly, when I submitted this, I don't know, a month ago or several weeks ago, really didn't have the answer. And there really wasn't uh, good answers, but somewhat fortuitously, I happened to participate in a CDC clinician call just two days ago on Saturday, where the whole topic had to do with uh, pediatrics and COVID. And I sort of wanted to review some of those and there were several slides that were presented and, and uh, Costa says, you know, I submitted some of those to you. So if you could bring some of those up, I'd be happy to uh, pre present at least a minimal uh, a brief uh, portion uh, of those slides. <clears throat> now, as uh, participating in this uh, session <clears throat> was uh, members of CDC and particularly uh, most of the slides I'm gonna present were presented by a pediatrician uh, who is an epidemiologist uh, at CDC. Also participating was the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a representative of uh, the uh, FDA. As a matter of fact, the director of the division that oversees uh, vaccine development and approval. So let me just start out uh, with this slide because uh, really looks at sort of an overview of the published literature concerning the epidemiology of SARS COVID-2, which is the virus associated with COVID-19 uh, in children. Now, there have been numerous studies published. The problem with them, most of these are what we call either convenience or observational studies. They're not randomized clinical trials, so you really can't get population-based uh, evidence of the true incidence or prevalence uh, from uh, these studies. You get sort of a general overall view. Uh, and then most of them lump... Um, children, or at least uh, those under the age of 18, all in one category. And as our pediatricians know, uh, that younger age, like under the age of four, physiologically is somewhat different than an adolescent or those that are 17 or 18 uh, years of age. And so that's uh, a bit of an issue uh, as well. But if you look at the published literature, um, there's mixed results. I mean, some studies suggest children are, are infected less. Some studies uh, show that they're uh, infected uh, as much as uh, uh, adults. We do know, however, that in general, the clinical manifestations is different, uh, that generally they have more mild uh, manifestations or at least a large uh, population of younger children anyway uh, can be infected and asymptomatic. Now we know that happens with adults as well, but it seems much more commonly uh, in children. The other issue is uh, to what extent can children uh, transmit the virus? And again, uh, the literature is somewhat mixed on that. Some say less uh, and some say it's similar to uh, older children uh, or adults. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, Costas, to look at specifically some of the numbers. Uh, this is a cohort study uh, that was uh, uh, studied between September of last year and February of this year. Now that's important because that does not include the Delta variants, which really did not uh, take hold in this country until about the end of May or early June. And that changed the whole concept or perspective of COVID-19, as I'm sure we'll discuss subsequently. But what this does show is that uh, for, at, during that time base, this, this, this was a cohort study where 300 households evaluated the potential for infection by being uh, tested weekly, whether they had symptoms or not. So you could look at the true incidence in this particular cohort. Uh, and you can see that the uh, age groups were divided into zero to four years, five to 11 years, 12 to 17 years, and then those over 18, you can see the, the lighter color is the younger, the darker color is the uh, older. Basically what it shows is no significant difference. If anything, the younger age group, less than four, particularly if you, could, if you look at the New York cohort, which is the bar graphs in the middle, uh, were slightly higher uh, than the others. But statistically, there was no significant uh, difference. So what it showed is that uh, children seem to be uh, the rate of infection just as high as other age groups. Now, if you look at the next slide, uh, this is a um, 
surveillance study looking at uh, laboratory reports, or at least blood that was submitted to labs across the country and designated by age. Now, again, in this particular study, for children, age was zero to 17. And we've already said that that may not be most appropriate. But what it shows is that the, um, the, the rate of positive uh, tests for uh, having a COVID based on antibody studies, and this is you know, labs that were sent, or at least blood that was sent to labs, not for COVID, but for other reasons, now, to look to see if we can get a sense of the prevalence uh, on the basis of these sur surveys that were uh, done in commercial labs. And you can see that the age group zero to 17 had the highest, I mean, it was 26%. Interestingly, in the uh, presentation, it was pointed out that those under the age of 12, or zero to 11, let's put it, versus 12 to 17, there was no significant difference. They both were about 25, uh, 26%. Now, this makes sense that they would be the highest here, because uh, at least those under 12 uh, are the ones that are unable to uh, receive the vaccine. Now, if you go to the older age groups, you can see that the uh, prevalence, the zero prevalence was... Uh, somewhat lower, but again, you're talking about age groups where the, um, the vaccine has been available. Now this did go through July of 2021. So when COVID was starting to be significant in this country. Uh, next slide. Uh, if we can, okay. So what about uh, visits to, um, to emergency rooms? This is a study and I'm gonna specifically focus on the right-hand part of the slide to look at the uh, age of uh, patients, of pediatric patients going to emergency rooms. And again, this is divided into three groups, zero to four, five to 11, and 12 to 17. Now uh, the zero to four doesn't show up very well, but I can tell you it's between the dotted line and the solid line. So they all show the same thing, that starting uh, in July, when we started to see the Delta, there was a significant increase in children coming to the uh, emergency room because of uh, COVID-19, uh, suggesting that number one, there's increased rate, and number two, as I'll talk about later, there does appear to be evidence that is accruing that the Delta is associated with a more severe disease. And so uh, these would be patients who were sick enough at least to come to the emergency room. Next slide. And then this looks specifically at hospitalizations. Um, and again, if you just focus on the right-hand part of the slide, it looks at uh, uh, children or, or at least those uh, zero to 17. And again, you can see starting in July, there was a significant uh, increase. And I think we're all aware of this, uh, that over the past month and a half, we've seen increase uh, incidents uh, actually all across the country, but specifically uh, in children. Now, it is interesting that if you look at uh, geographic areas of the country, most of all of this is from the South and Mid-South. I'm talking about Florida over to Texas. Uh, if you look specifically at Ohio, while there is a slight increase, it's not anywhere near uh, where this is. Although it's really interesting if you look at Ohio because Southern Ohio has a higher incidence uh, than actually uh, where we are in uh, Northern Ohio. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, I just wanted to point this slide out because I'm sure there's going to be very interest uh, from our whole group about this. This is the uh, one slide from the presentation of Peter Marks, who uh, is the director of the uh, vaccine area in uh, FDA. And as he indicated that, um, you know, adolescents 12 years and older are being dosed at the same uh, 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 dose and uh, vaccine as adults. He did make the point, however, that those under the age of 12, uh, you have to consider the differences in the pharmacokinetics and the dose. And so you can't give the same dose to a two-year-old as you would give to a 20-year-old. So that's why some of these studies need to be looking at what is the specific uh, dose that is, that is appropriate for the child, uh, what is the duration between uh, doses, et cetera. So this is why it's a little bit more complicated to evaluate the uh, uh, vaccine studies in the younger uh, age group than it was in the, uh, in the older age group where you use the same uh, vaccine. But having said that, 
He did indicate uh, that he expects the data to be available by the end of next month and within about four weeks and that they would start evaluating it. And usually even after they uh, have the data available, it takes about another four to six weeks to uh, make a decision about authorization. So if you're asking when uh, vaccines may be available for children, you know, six months and older, uh, up to age uh, 11 or 12, probably not till the end of November, early December. It would be the earliest I would predict, but that could obviously change. Custis, I think I'll uh, end uh, with the response to that question here. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom, for that uh, updated information. Our next question uh, goes to uh, Dr. Constantino. What is the best way to discuss COVID-19 with my children at different ages of development without frightening or alarming them unnecessarily? Thank you, Costas, and thank you all for asking me to join this conversation tonight. I think it's really important that we think about how we can help our children of all ages get through what has been a very challenging time for every single one of us. So clearly our children are looking for us to be kind of the, the leaders of the family, to be the people who pass up the information. And just as you would be thinking about what do you say to your children if a family member is ill, what do you say to your children if there are stressors, you're thinking about how old are they and what can they tolerate. So for infants and toddlers, all they really want to know is that they're safe and secure with you. Uh, they don't need long explanations. On the other end of the developmental continuum, we have our adolescents who have missed school, they've missed their peers, they have questions, they are, have tremendous access to social media, and they will want to, to dialogue with you. Our preschoolers, to back up our infants, our preschoolers, again, uh, if a preschooler asked you, mommy, how's a baby born? You wouldn't give them the whole biological detail. You would give them the information that was useful to them at their age, which is the basic facts without going into a lot of detail. The group that's kind of the most difficult, I think, are the are children who are between the ages of six and 12, because they're very concrete in their thinking. They cannot infer, they cannot add, their logic is a little bit tainted by where they are developmentally. So we have to be pretty thoughtful about what we explain and answer the question that they're asking us. And we can talk later about what are the kinds of questions kids want to know. But I think the most important thing in talking to our children is to reassure them that we are in charge. And I guess I want to remind everybody about the example of what's said on an airplane about the oxygen mask, which is if you remember the first thing that is said to you when you sit down in your seat is you put your own oxygen mask on first before you help someone else. Because if you're not with it, you can't help anyone else. And I just want to repeat that in terms of a parenting principle or precept, which is that first we have to have it together before we can talk to our children. And I just wanna share something, which is that the American Psychological Association, actually in January of 2021, they do one every year, did a stress in America study and were absolutely blown away that seven or eight out of 10 Americans were reporting how anxious and stressed they were. So I think we have to think about our own oxygen masks before we answer any questions to our children. Um, we all have the skill to answer the questions, but we really need to have our acts together psychologically before we respond to the question. Thanks, Georgette. Our next question is for Dr. Hackenberg. Is the COVID-19 vaccine safe? Sorry, Doug, you're on mute. Thank you for that. Um, so I think the short answer is yes. As the younger kids, we haven't seen the data yet, but with the, the number of thousands of kids who were studied in the above 12 group and the millions of doses um, that have been given, we have no reason to believe that they're not extremely safe. There are in adolescent young men, a slight increase in some heart inflammation that typically resolves in four to six weeks but that is still much less than the rate that you can get similar inflammation with actually contracting the virus. So short answer is yes, I think it is safe. 
Thank you. Hey, Dr. Justice, Dr. Please. Uh, do you mind if I just reinforce what uh, Dr. Hagenberg said as well? Sure. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on that because uh, I want to remind us now, just literally maybe more than a week ago, uh, the FDA actually approved the COVID vaccine, not for children, obviously, but for those 16 uh, and, and over. And that's a big step because uh, when they actually give official approval, that means that they've gone through very extensive, comprehensive scientific criteria to make sure that this vaccine is number one safe. That's number one, but then also is effective. And it's amazing that we have such an effective vaccine to reduce the uh, morbidity and mortality of this infection. But I, I want to make sure that you know we reinforce that it is safe. <clears throat> and there was a in the lead art article in uh, the most recent issue of New England Journal of Medicine has to do with the safety of the COVID vaccine uh, that is uh, manufactured by Pfizer, which is the one that has received the, the approval. And um, the nice thing about New England Journal of Medicine, you can uh, access any of their COVID articles free just going to their website. Uh, and the lead article in the most recent issue has to do with the safety of the COVID vaccine. Now, I acknowledge that this is mostly the experience that is in adults, but it's really interesting to go through that and put it in perspective, because if you look at all of the potential occurrences or IE side effects of the vaccine, these are occurrences that can occur in patients who have COVID-19. Like Dr. Hackenberg mentioned myocarditis. Well, if you look at patients who have COVID-19 infection, they're much more likely to have myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, than if they receive the vaccine. So the vaccine actually reduces the incidence of myocarditis in a sense. So um, if people are interested in learning more about the actual safety based on a scientific assessment, you can go to the New England Journal of Medicine and access that uh, for free. So thanks for allowing me to make those comments. Sure, thanks, Tom. A question for Dr. Forbes. If vaccinated and unvaccinated both can transmit the virus, what's the point in getting vaccinated? Wow, thanks, uh, Koss. That's a terrific question. And uh, also thanks for the opportunity to, to learn and speak with this group. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I get that question asked in my family all the time. What's the point? Um, I think I want to start fairly early in the my explanation. And that is the, the first principle I think that many of the general public doesn't understand is when we, when we create a vaccine, vaccines are not generally created to prevent mild disease. Uh, they're generated predominantly to prevent serious morbidity, disability, and death. That's the general driver, the real reason why we get behind these vaccines to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And so while many people who have COVID infections um, most probably are asymptomatic, they don't even know they're contagious, um, the vaccine won't necessarily let you uh, have less mild infection. So lots of people may say, well, I have the vaccine and I'm still getting a cold. Uh, why did I even get the vaccine? Well, the, the purpose of the vaccine was to make sure that you don't die or end up in the ICU or end up in the emergency department. It was not designed to prevent mild symptoms. That's really important because many people have interpreted mild symptoms after the vaccine or a cold symptom, or even getting COVID after the, the vaccine as a failure of the vaccine. Well, you know, again, the, the purpose of the vaccine was really not to prevent mild symptoms. The, the second reason is uh, when it comes to getting the vaccine, we've learned uh, and although the studies go back and forth on this, and I'd be interested in knowing what Dr. Faust's thoughts are on this, it appears that the long lasting effects of the vaccine with respect to protection against COVID-19 may be in fact more enduring than natural immunity to some degree. There is evidence that there is uh, B cell and plasma cell activation and memory, uh, meaning long standing immune memory after the vaccine that seems to be much more robust than after a natural infection. And, and so I, I think that with respect to getting the vaccine, the, the advantage to me is that it prevents death. 
in fact, it's over 95, I read 99.9% .9 in some instances, effective at preventing death. And so if you're not interested in dying from COVID-19, and we have a safe, highly effective vaccine, that's the reason to get the vaccine, uh, not to prevent mild disease. And as we've learned more recently, which is a tad disappointing, but not surprising, it doesn't necessarily reduce transmission either. And so getting the vaccine really is a way to, to choose life, frankly, is kind of how I look at it. Thank you. Thank you for that. A question for Dr. Tsurambidis. Uh, my child isn't vaccinated. Does he or she really have to wear a mask? So I was just listening to Dr. Forbes answer and I think he really just um, spot on helped us with that question. Um, obviously now I think we've learned that the recommendation is regardless of vaccination status. So even if you are or you're not, the kids in universal indoor masking is helpful as the kids are all going back to school. Um, well, first we also know that the 12 to 17 year old range right now is and Dr. File, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like less than 50% of that age group is vaccinated right now and the kids are back to school. Um, we also are seeing um, increase in other illnesses that we didn't see as much uh, through the winter and now surging in the summers and into the fall. So RSV and other things in the younger kids. So um, really, uh, if your child's not vaccinated, I think it would make sense to wear that mask. But regardless of vaccination status, as we're sending our kids back to school while they're indoors um, and all those schools have it as an option, many, um, wearing the mask makes sense. Um, and my kids uh, said it's okay. They've come home and wore their mask and they're okay. Thanks, Julie. Uh, follow up question to that for, for Dr. File. Uh, is there a difference? Is there a dif difference in risk of transmission in uh, children that wear cloth masks versus surgical masks? Okay, I unmuted myself. Well, there is a slight difference. I mean, it depends upon the, the barrier effect uh, and, and the uh, filtration effect uh, of the masks. I mean, you know, we use uh, in the hospital setting, in the healthcare setting, when we're seeing patients, we use a very efficient um, filtered mask, you know, the N95. But um, the, if you use a multi-layered cloth mask, it's actually very good. Uh, as opposed to uh, the surgical mask. Uh, but let me make a point here that, you know, the real reason that we wear masks is to uh, establish source control. So we don't spread it to other people. I mean, uh, it was already mentioned uh, that, you know, a lot of uh, patients could be infected, uh, can um, be asymptomatic, but yet transmitting, and particularly with the Delta variant. Now, this did not occur, quite honestly, with the prior variants, like the Alpha variant. If you were asymptomatic, you were sh shedding much less amount of virus, and you really weren't transmitting it to others. But with the Delta, and, and that's why uh, it was just mentioned that now we recommend that when you're inside, you should always be wearing a mask, whether you're vaccinated uh, or not. Uh, but it really doesn't matter, quite honestly, uh, whether you use a, a multi-layered cloth one, uh, a uh, surgical mask, uh, or an N95. They're all going to be helpful in preventing uh, me from uh, transmitting to you. I mean, I was literally at a, a function uh, yesterday, and I had a mask. Most people did not have a mask. It was inside. And I, I was asked by one person, why am I wearing a mask? And I said, because I'm protecting you. And I'm, you know, in protecting uh, everybody else. And then when it was already mentioned that, you know, less than, well, only about 50, 55 percent of uh, the of uh, the population of Ohio are fully immunized. And it's until you're fully immunized, really, that you're you know, fully protected as as best as possible. And so you have to assume when you're inside with a congregate setting that probably 40, 45 percent aren't even um, vaccinated. They and according to seroprevalence models, probably five to 10% of those people that aren't vaccinated potentially could have asymptomatic infection and therefore shedding it. And so in order to protect ourselves when we're inside, as I was already said, uh, you know, the, the guidance is that we should be wearing masks. And, and a follow-up question, uh, Tom, for you, just to take a step back, why is the Delta variant more contagious than earlier variants of COVID? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And this has led to uh, all the problems that we're having now. I mean, the uh, evolution of the Delta variant in this country really changed the whole perspective of COVID. If you go back to May, I mean, the incidence of uh, uh, COVID-19 was dramatically dropping. I mean, if you looked at the numbers of, of positive cases per 100,000 population in Ohio, it was down to 16. Now we're back up to well over 300. And it's all because of the more contagiousness of, of this uh, uh, Delta virus. And that's how it's changed from going to no masks inside, now to everybody masking inside, because we have to do whatever we can to reduce the transmission. The best way to do that, obviously, is get everybody vaccinated. Uh, then we also mentioned the, um, the, the benefit of, of the mask. But to answer your question specifically, uh, why is it uh, more contagious? Well, there's several reasons. Number one, there's a higher binding capacity of the virus, of, of the spike protein, which is the part of the virus on the surface that's that spike, uh, when you look at the cartoon, that attaches to our cells, to uh, our cells when uh, we uh, are exposed to the virus. So there's a higher binding capacity. So more of the virus can attach to our cells. Then once it gets in our cells, the replication rate is much higher. So you're uh, producing more virus. That means that when you shed, you're, you're spreading more virus. And so uh, it's, it's more contagious uh, because of that. And as a matter of fact, um, the, uh, the contagiousness now is about two or three times more than even influenza or that uh, alpha variant. And I might also add accruing data suggesting, and I think I already mentioned this, but that not only is it more contagious, but it does appear, that, at least in recent studies, that, and of course this is mostly in adults, but that it is associated with more severe disease. And that probably uh, you know, reflects why even in children, we're seeing more incidents uh, in, at least in the country, not necessarily in Ohio specifically, or at least Akron, I should say, uh, more uh, emergency room visits, more hospital admissions, even in children. Thanks, Tom, for that. Uh, one housekeeping point, please, if, if uh, you have not yet uh, muted your microphone on your phone or iPad or computer, please do so, so that uh, we don't have any background noise. Thank you. Next question is for uh, Dr. Constantino. If my child asks me what might happen to him or her if he or she contracts COVID, what is the best way to reply? That's a very good question. If children are worried, I think that children are picking up from their parents, from their grandparents, that there, there's worry and anxiety. And if your child is asking you what would happen to me, what you're going to talk to them about is, what you're going to do for them. You cannot say you're going to be hospitalized, you're going to be in an emergency room. What you say to your child is, if you get sick with COVID, I'm going to take care of you as I would with anything else that would happen to you. When you had the flu or when you had a broken leg, I'm going to take you to the doctor and we are going to make sure that you stay safe. Uh, I think that that's the reassurance that children want, that the doctors that we take them to care about them. We have um, Dr. Hackenberg here, who's a fabulous pediatrician, Dr. Forbes, who has been the most wonderful, wonderful intensivist that, that I know in my career, who takes wonderful care and reassures children, um, as does my niece, Dr. Tidambidis, that we're here to take good care of you. We cannot tell them that they won't get sick. We can't make promises that we can't keep because then we have lost our trust. But what I do want parents to say is, I'm gonna be with you every step of the way if you get sick. I'm gonna to explain to you what's going on. I'm gonna get you the best possible care and we're in this together and we're gonna take care of this. Children want the reassurance that they're not the ones in control that their parents are. Um, even with children who have cancer who ask the question, and I'm looking to you, Dr. Forbes, children who physically in the intensive care unit have asked Dr. Forbes, um, am I gonna die? You know, and we've, we've talked about these things over my career, we would never look at a child and say, yeah, you're going to die of COVID. People die of COVID. Children don't need that information. They need to know we do everything possible to take the best possible care of them as we always would. Thanks, Georgia. A question for Dr. Hackenberg. What do you see happening in schools this fall uh, from, from this vantage point today, August 30th? 
I really think it depends on what the schools are doing. If we learn from schools down south who weren't masking and weren't requiring it, there were school systems that would have in the first week 250 kids out positive and 1,000 to 2,000 students and staff out quarantining. So I think that answers the mask question, but also hopefully will push other school systems that are not mandating masks to do so in an effort to prevent our school system and our children being affected in that way. Sure. Question for Dr. Forbes. With uh, uh, RSV uh, the, um, surging in the summer, uh, particularly around this time, how likely is that the fall and winter will bring RSV flu and COVID-19? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, how do you tell the, the difference clinically um, of those three? Yeah, great, great question. I'll answer the easy one uh, first, and that is there's, there's no difference. There's no <clears throat> easy way to tell the difference between RSV, influenza, coronavirus, para-influenza virus. Uh, I, I, use, I refer to them as the winter viruses. Lots of people do. They're, they're kind of a gang of viruses. Every year, every winter, we can predict uh, a pretty, um, uh, uh, pretty stereotypic or, or uh, expected rise in the rate of flu and RSV. Rhinovirus just kind of keeps on keeping on. <laughs> that really doesn't change a whole lot. Um, but this, the first part of the question is, is really provocative, and that is uh, with RSV showing up in the middle of the summer, which in my entire career I've never seen before. There are parts of the world where RSV is not seasonal. It's more than 10 percent. Many, you know, throughout the year, there's even parts of Florida where there's no real RSV season. It's just RSV all, all year round. What we're seeing this year uh, you know, it's it's hard to tell exactly why, but we know that last year's winter viruses infects, and again, the, the reason they keep coming back is most winter viruses, when they infect us, do not make us ill. Otherwise, people back away from us and the virus isn't transmitted. And so it's very clever that again, back to the evolution of the viruses that Dr. File talked about, when you're infected, you're not. Uh, symptomatic. So you touch doorknobs, you go into cars, you shake people's hands, you hug and you infect them. You don't know you're infected. They don't know you're infected. Now you're both infected. And so that level of asymptomatic transmission creates a background immunity in the community. And so last year's winter viruses protects to some degree this year's community. Well, last year we masked, we distanced, we uh, washed our hands, we, we did all of those things um, in order to mitigate against coronavirus. And it turns out we also mitigated against flu and RSV. We're used to about 1,000 cases, we're about 60,000 or so cases of influenza every year. I think last year there may not have even been 1,000 cases in the United States. Uh, the vaccine's great, but it's not that great against influenza. And more importantly with RSV, there's no RSV vaccine. But I can tell you, we had studies and we have num numerous studies, full disclosure, one of my areas of research is RSV. And we have studies that we, we have ready to go to do with RSV. We didn't do any of them last year. There was no disease and there's no vaccine. And so from an observational standpoint, you have to conclude that distancing, masking, washing your hands really makes a humongous difference in reducing transmission. What about this winter that's coming? Well, right now we're in the middle of an incredible surge of RSV in the pediatric community. Rhinovirus, as I mentioned, kind of keeps on keeping on. We have not seen influenza in the community. And of course, COVID is also on the rise in children. And so going into the winter, uh, we have less background immunity from RSV. We're already seeing the results of that. There's likely less background immunity against influenza. Um, the vaccination rate is hopefully going to keep going up, 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 so we see less COVID disease. And we have to continue to mitigate. But there are people who won't mask. There are people who've kind of just given up because they're tired. You know, COVID fatigue is real. And so I think now that we've started school and people are 
shaking hands and touching doorknobs and going out to eat again and living their life <clears throat> uh, without restraint. I think there's a, there's a pretty good likelihood that we'll be seeing uh, the flu and coronavirus, uh, if not simultaneously, one wave after another, after another, after another. My guess is what we're seeing now with RSV will, will wane because there will be immunity in the community, but on the heels of RSV will be probably a little more coronavirus. And as we go deeper into the winter, we're gonna see flu. And so I and many others are, are very concerned about what this is gonna mean going into the fall. Um, so I think that the, what we learned last year though, I mean, that's the bad news potentially, but the good news is we know how to blunt this. We know how to tamp this down, right? Keep your hands clean, wear your mask, get vaccinated and keep your distance. And so we know what works. Um, It'll be interesting to see if people follow through. Hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, once again, please, if if um, you are not, your microphone is not muted. Please mute your microphone on your iPhone, iPad, the laptop thing. Question for Dr. File uh, that had come in: Are you concerned about girls and young women becoming infertile after receiving the COVID nineteen vaccine? Absolutely not. <laughs> There's no scientific rationale or evidence to suggest that at all. I mean, um, the hundreds of thousands of uh, childbearing uh, women or childbearing age uh, women who have received the vaccine and then gone on to be pregnant, I mean, there's no difference in their ability to conceive compared to those who have not received uh, the vaccine. Uh, Unfortunately, there was some misinformation that was uh, spread um, amongst the social media to suggest that one of the antibodies uh, that's produced uh, against the spike protein, which is, uh, you know, what is in the vaccine, may cross-react with the protein in the placenta, but that's absolutely false. That does not occur, um, and all of the evidence for those that have received the vaccine and gone on to conceive does not support that at all. So that, that should not be an issue. Thank you for that. Uh, question for Dr. Constantino. How can I control my own anxiety to be the best role model for resiliency uh, throughout this time? Thank you for that question, Costa. Uh, as I said, we have many, many of us, myself included in the last year, who have experienced anxiety that is not our typical go-to position. I think that all of us have not had the kind of information we usually have in making decisions. This, we've never, I've never lived through a pandemic, neither has anybody else on the screen. And this is a new experience for all of us. And so it's very natural and it's very normal to feel anxious when you're not in control, when you don't have all of the information, when the information is changing. Nevertheless, having said that, it is absolutely our responsibility as parents to get our own anxiety under control, to monitor, put on that oxygen mask, figure out what helps us calm down, engage in self-care, whether that be exercise or meditation or calling friends. One of the things that has happened to all of us um, really until the vaccine came out is that we were isolated from social contact in a way that none of us have ever experienced. And so normal interactions with grandparents, with family gatherings in, in our church, there weren't church services, we were doing them by Zoom. All of these things were changes for us and we had to adapt to them. But I strongly believe that we are very, that the human being is very resilient and that we are the role models for our children as to how do you cope? And we have coped. We've coped very well through a global pandemic. And I think we need to remind ourselves how well we're doing and to communicate that to our children that our family may be doing things differently, but we're still an intact family. We're going to have activities. We're going to change it up a little bit. We may, for many people had Christmases and Thanksgivings in the small doses instead of being around a big family gathering. I think it's really important to model and to talk about how we're coping and that we are coping because these are life lessons for our children. 
how are we getting through a tough time? This is how we get through a tough time. And one of the things that I have been concerned about in my entire career is that we have been raising a generation of kids who don't have good coping skills and for whom um, anxiety and depression have skyrocketed over the last 10, 20 years. And when I stop to think about it, I ask myself, are we promising children that life's gonna be perfect? Are we putting our children in a bubble where we say, I'll take care of everything for you, as opposed to pulling down, getting the strength and saying, these are tough days, but we're gonna get through them. We, we always do, we use our faith, we can pray together, we can worship together, we can communicate, look at how we're doing this on Zoom. All of these are coping mechanisms. And I really strongly believe that we need to pull out those coping mechanisms and share them with our children so they understand how they're going to cope. So I know that's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but I think it's really an important one to remind ourselves that our children are watching us constantly for how it is we're coping. And some of you, I know our grandparents, they're looking to the older generations to say, how'd you do it? Um, and I know we get stories, telling them stories of tough times you have been through and come through, I think are wonderful experiences for children to have. Uh, so that, that's how I would reply. Thanks, Georgia. Question for Dr. Hackenberg. Uh, what activities are safe for my child um, in terms of um, you know, school activities, sports, indoors, outdoors? So, yes, yeah, certainly um, outdoor activities are much better, but you want to still be mindful of distancing and uh, even masking if they're going to be closer contact, like team sports who have huddles. You know, a lot of teams would recommend to have the kids put their masks on in a huddle. We know risk of disease on a soccer field is much less than in an unmasked classroom. Um, closer indoor sports, you know, like indoor soccer, indoor basketball where you're moving, maybe are okay, but you have to, people have to decide their own level of comfort. Um, certainly indoor like parties and close knit things, even with masking, increase the risk. Um, and I, I'm assuming this is all an unvaccinated, you know, conversation in the smaller kids versus the vaccinated Older kids maybe have a little more freedom, but you still want to be smart and keep your distance when possible and wear masks when possible. Great. Thanks, Doug. So I have a series of questions here for, for Dr. File with respect to boosters, and I want to be sure I get them all here. So um, the first one is, are vaccine boosters necessary? Uh, the second one is essentially the same thing. Do all three types of COVID-19 vaccines available in the U.S. require boosters? And the, the third sort of part of that is, do you have to get the same brand vaccine booster as the initial vaccine that you received? Well, yeah, we're hearing a lot about the uh, information about boosters, uh, particularly as they're going to be evaluated by uh, CDC uh, and FDA. As everybody is, I'm sure, aware, the uh, FDA did authorize uh, the boosters, or at least the third dose, because it just applies to the mRNA vaccines, not the J&J, &J, uh, which is one of the questions you ask. But um, for the uh, mRNA vaccines, which is the Moderna and the Pfizer, they did authorize a third dose for those who are immunocompromised. Uh, these are patients, for example, who have transplants or on immunocompromising uh, therapy for that, or they're receiving chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, that's where the best data is. But I mean, the actual authorization by FDA uh, extended it to anybody who's on in immunosuppressive therapy. And so there's a lot of patients with arthritis, a lot of patients in your field, uh, Costas, who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, who are on these biologics uh, that are very helpful for the patient, quite honestly, and, and almost it changes uh, their life because they're so good. Uh, but as we know that they can uh, suppress the immune system uh, and so these types of uh, medicines are also included in that list for which um, uh, the, uh, the third uh, dose of, of the Pfizer or the Moderna is now uh, authorized. That does not apply to J&J &J yet uh, because we don't have the information uh, for J&J. &J. So we'll have to wait and see. Now you have to remember 
J&J &J did not start uh, uh, use of that uh, vaccine until about March, as opposed to the Pfizer and the Moderna, which is uh, the end of uh, December. So we just don't have as much information about J&J uh, &J as far as the um, the need for the uh, another dose, because J&J &J was just a one dose a regimen. Um, but if you're gonna get uh, a third dose, it's recommended that it should be the same vaccine that you received the first two doses. So if it's Pfizer, you get a Pfizer. If it's Moderna, you get a Moderna. However, if that's not feasible, it's okay to uh, intermix them as long as it's uh, an mRNA uh, vaccine. Now, the other issue is, um, what about immunocompetent persons? You know, not those that are on these immunocompromising uh, conditions. And you've probably heard that the, uh, uh, the administration, uh, at least for, through the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, actually about another week and a half ago, uh, uh, posted information that they thought by the end of next month or specifically uh, 20th of September that uh, they were gonna be recommending a third dose or so-called boosters to those who have received uh, the mRNA vaccines earlier. Um, however, let me just indicate that that is based on both the FDA and the CDC conducting independent uh, studies to see how that would best be implemented. I suspect that will be happening, but it's not gonna be for everybody. I think uh, based on uh, studies that are showing a little bit of waning of uh, antibody levels, uh, and maybe some uh, breakthrough cases that Dr. Forbes already mentioned. But let me just reinforce, I mean, we're seeing a surge in our hospital. I mean, we've got about 50 patients in the hospital now, like about 10 or 12 in the ICU. Everybody in the ICU is uh, our patients who have never been vaccinated. They're unvaccinated. 91% of the patients we're seeing in our hospital are those because they were never vaccinated. So just to reinforce what Dr. Forbes said earlier, that the vaccine, even after six to eight months, very effectively reduces the chance of having serious disease. The breakthrough cases may be, uh, occur, but they're usually uh, very mild. And, and that does reflect, as he said, this, the success uh, of the virus. So um, once we have more information that comes from uh, FDA, and then, then more specifically, the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is the committee from CDC, which gives guidance of how we should uh, administer these vaccines, then we'll know when we who are immunocompetent would be receiving uh, a third dose. What I anticipate is that it'll be patients or, or persons who will receive the vaccine at least six, maybe eight months earlier. So you might have a waning <coughs> of... Uh, of your antibodies. But as Dr. Forbes says, that doesn't mean that your immune system is deficient because you still have your T cell um, uh, immunity that is still gonna be very active if it uh, recognizes one of these uh, viruses. And um, those uh, who probably are older or who would be at higher risk uh, perhaps of having uh, complications. So we'll have to wait for the guidance from CDC. Tom, as a follow-up to that, do you an anticipate um, over the next few months that if there are increasing variants to the virus, that the, the time frame to get boosters will need to be shortened from six to eight months to four to six? Or, or, or... Well, quite honestly, what we really need, Costas, is not so much the third dose or the booster. We need the 45% who have never received one vaccine to get immunized. Because if we did that, we wouldn't be having the problem we have now. Uh, because clearly we have the way out of this uh, pandemic. We have the tool, it's a tremendously effective tool and it's very safe. And so if we can uh, encourage more of those that have not been immunized, remember that's about 45% of, of the population. Uh, and, and the problem is, you know, with this highly contagious Delta variant, we need a much higher immunity rate. I mean, it initially was thought, well, maybe 65, 70% uh, would have been adequate. I mean, quite honestly, if, if we would have not had this Delta variant and we would have just had the Alpha variant, I really think that the amount of uh, immun immunity we have now would have been adequate to essentially stop the pandemic. But obviously the Delta came in and changed the whole game. So now we need probably at least 85%. Uh, immune in order to do that. And the problem is, 
even with 55% of the population immunized, we're still, still seeing rise in cases. That means that there's increased virus that's being transmitted. That means that there's virus that's replicating. As the virus replicates, it can mutate. As it mutates, you might find another variant, which may be even worse than the Delta, because at least with the Delta, we know that the vaccines are effective uh, and, we, and all our uh, therapeutic interventions, as, as far as antiviral therapy, anti-inflammatory uh, therapy are, are beneficial. What we don't wanna see is a variant that may be resistant to all of those effects. And unless we can stop transmission, we're, we're at risk of seeing a, such a variant occur. Great, thank you for that. Now, question that came in, and, and this may have been answered earlier, but someone sent it on the chat here. Uh, I'll, I'll send it over to, to Dr. Hackenberg. Uh, if, let's see, is it safe for children under the age of 12 to obtain the COVID vaccine if approved? Um, I think there's every reason to think so, yes. But again, that's why they study it. That's why they have to submit the data for approval. So I'll say I'd be surprised if not, but we don't know until the data is released and evaluated, um, hopefully sooner than later. But my expectation, fingers crossed, is that yes, it'll be fine. Thanks for that. Uh Question for uh, Dr. Constantinou that came in um, last week. So how can we help children not be so connected to social media in a time when we have been so reliant on social media? I'm smiling because it is really a huge challenge. And this is when we have some tough parenting decisions. Um, I hear lots of people using the word Zoom burnout you know, professionals saying, I can't be on one more Zoom call. I've never seen kids say that, you know, when they have these little things in their hands, they can be there forever. I think we really have to help our kids to disconnect. And that means we have to make, they're not gonna disconnect. So we have to make those rules for them. We have to have times that all, and I'm talking about, just let me give you an example. We have a sleep, disorder clinic at Akron Children's Hospital. And one of the things that our sleep physicians tell families from children who are not sleeping at night is please disconnect from all electronics or blue lights two hours before bedtime. And the parents look like they're going to pass out when we give them that information. Like, oh my God, how would I ever do that? So I think these are a family value decisions that have to be made that say, we don't take our cell phones to dinner. We turn off all of our electronics and we talk to one another. Uh, and this is something that has to happen whether we're in the middle of a pandemic or not. So th this is a lot of tough love parenting, but uh, I can only tell you that we, we have to do it. Otherwise our kids are so reliant on social media that they're really taking their phones to bed at night and not sleeping uh, and, and texting and, Instagramming or whatever the most recent thing is all through the night. So the answer is with your, with your family members, sit down and figure out what the house rules are and then enforce them. Great, thank you for that. Question for Father Jerry. How is the church protecting children and all parishioners who are vaccinated and unvaccinated given the current Delta surge? Okay, thank you. And I wanna offer my thanks to all the healthcare professionals who are with us tonight and for providing all this really great information. I really appreciate it on behalf of the community. Um, so when we were going through the first uh, sort of surge, we were acting in, you know, really looking to the metropolis and acting with, uh, in concert with the metropolis guidelines. Um, and so they were following the, you know, the local um, authorities when we were going through the lockdowns. And, and so at this point, since we haven't had any of those official um, sort of lockdowns, the Metropolis has not, hasn't really given us any other directives in terms of, um, you know, mandatory things, just sort of like 
we have in, you know, within the community, we have the CDC recommendations, which offer these, uh, um, you know, this choice to, to mask or not and trying to let people know um, what the what the risks are, as we've um, you know we've heard really clearly tonight, um, and so we've just been offering that choice to to mask or not. Um, we've tried to make it as you know as open as possible for people to to choose and to feel comfortable with whatever their choice has been. Um, in terms of the Sunday school year coming up, um, again we're going to um, at this point still. Um, allow parents to make that choice for their for their children, um, and uh, we will um, and you know and can again recommend that they that they offer that and do that. And we'll um, we've talked about the fact that we want any parent or ch child to come and to feel comfortable with whatever you know their choice has been. Um, we will be asking the the parents. You know to notify the the Sunday school if if their children do show any kind of symptoms so that we can let other members in the um, in the class know. Um, and I think that we will try to do a better job in terms of just signage and the and the facility um, about you know reminding people about the the benefits of of masking. Thanks for that. Uh, we had a question that came in here for, for Dr. Forbes here late. Uh, how often are you seeing healthy children without com comorbidities under the age of five in the hospital and or ICU with COVID? Yeah, great question. Um, so to date uh, in the ICU, uh, we have not seen healthy preschool children with COVID. That's great news. Um, I will extend my answer, though, and then echo what I think I heard Dr. File mentioned, and that is the Delta variant is a game changer. Last, last year, pediatric COVID for us here in Akron and even in Ohio was pretty uncommon. You know, healthy kids coming in with COVID lung disease or any other manifestation of COVID other than MISC, which is a, a different kind of a different animal altogether, but direct infection with COVID causing hospitalizations in preschool children was just an, an anomaly. In older kids, and let's say kids under, under 13, uh, nationwide, we have seen a rise in the number of hospitalized, including critically ill children with COVID. And so the Delta variant, especially in the South, I think you, you've heard it all in the news, in the Carolinas, Georgia, Texas, Mississippi, Florida, uh, colleagues of ours, I say ours because we all have friends all over the country, uh, their ICUs are, are full. Uh, with children, previously healthy children, uh, who are now critically ill, fighting for their lives due to COVID caused by the Delta variant. And so this is not the same surge as last year. This is very different. And so when we hear people say it is kind of being overblown and all that, uh, I, I can understand the, the skepticism, but I honestly think it's ignorance and skepticism. Because if you know what we know, you know, as, as Dr. File, I think, articulated clearly earlier, there's an evolution to these viruses. And so the alpha variant was what it was. We're now up to the delta variant. And there are other variants of interest that are being followed by the CDC. And this isn't to be melodramatic or scary. It's just the way viruses work. And so if you continue to allow them to spread and mutate and transform, at some point they're going to they're going to win. They're going to take advantage of us, and so I think it's really important to do the things that we know to do to make sure that you know last year kids were largely spared. This year we're not seeing that. Kids are affected. Kids are critically ill. Kids are dying from this, um, and so I, I think we have an opportunity to stop the spread. And so masking, distancing, washing your hands, getting vaccinated. Again, we, we know what works and it's, it's, it is uncommon, right? Because most kids never end up in the ICU. But when that happens to you or your loved one, frankly, might as well be 100%. That's all you care about. And so we have an opportunity to stop the spread of this thing. And just, I don't want to hear about the epsilon and the chi and the gap. I don't want to hear about any more variants. Um, but I'm afraid that if we don't do what we're supposed to do, we're going to see lots more kids critically ill, uh, fighting for their lives and dying, uh, just like our elderly population did last year. 
Thanks for that. A question for Dr. File. Um, uh, how does the pandemic end even if vaccinated people are transmitting the virus and letting it mutate, especially when most of the world won't have access to vaccines for a long time? Excellent point. I mean, this is a global, as has already been mentioned, a global pandemic. So, I mean, even though we, we can have relative uh, rates of uh, immunization in, in this country, we need it worldwide. And of course, as you, I'm sure you're aware, I mean, uh, the manufacturers in this country are disseminating it uh, to uh, other parts of the world. So we really are not going to be safe until the world is, is safe and we've contained this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be an issue. But I want to go back to this, uh, this question about, you know, if you've been vaccinated and you can still transmit it, what's the value of getting vaccinated? Well, I, I think there's a misnomer there because if you're vaccinated, there's at least a 90% chance you're not gonna get this infection at all, as opposed to somebody who's vaccinated. So it's only if you have a breakthrough case that you would be able to potentially transmit. And as I said earlier, with this Delta, even if uh, you have a breakthrough case, even if you're asymptomatic, the amount of uh, virus that is being shed by the person is, fairly high um, enough that there can be transmitted, which is totally different than the prior variants because that did not happen. Uh, but we have to remember that those who have received the vaccine, it's going to be very unlikely that they're ever going to be uh, infected. And so we have to uh, keep that in mind that this vaccine, it really does even prevent mild symptomatic disease. I mean, when you have 20 million Americans who have been at least received the first dose and, and 180 some or 190 have been fully immunized. And if you, if, if you have a vaccine that's 90% uh, protective, you know, that means that still 20 million are gonna potentially have a breakthrough case. But of those 20 million, uh, probably 90% of those are gonna have such mild cases that they aren't gonna to have to get into the hospital. I saw the chat from Akron General, which is exactly what we saw at SUMA, that almost all of the patients that are in the hospital and everyone in the ICU are amongst those who are unvaccinated. So I think it's a misnomer to, to say that, you know, getting the vaccine, you're still gonna transmit. Now, we do know that the duration of transmission of the breakthrough cases in somebody who's been vaccinated is significantly less than the amount or the duration of transmission in somebody who's unvaccinated, even though there may be a period of time when the amount of virus may be very similar, the duration of, of, the, um, uh, of the transmission is much less. So even in those breakthrough cases, there is gonna be less transmission because of the less duration of the uh, virus that's being shed. Thank you for that. Um, this will be a, a general question um, that, that came in and, and I, I will ask each of the um, healthcare professionals on the, panel, on the panel to maybe chime in. We'll go around the room. We'll start with um, uh, Dr. Constantino. So the, the question is, how do you talk to healthcare um, staff that work with you um, that refuse to get the vaccine if they're an institution at an institution, for example, where the vaccine is not uh, yet mandated or is not mandated till October, November, December. So I'm going to politely uh, pass simply because by being retired, I am not in the hospital at this point. Um, I'm, but I am at the university at Kent, and I will share with you that there is a mandate that every student there must come into class with a mask on and, and a few of them, first day of class, tried to run by and I had some extra masks and handed them to the, you need that you need to put your mask on, I've got an extra one for you. And uh, I spoke to the class that was fully masked and said, because I'm sure half of them yet are not vaccinated, Kent State came out saying that they must be by the end of the year. Uh, but I said to them, we're, we're here to keep each other safe. Well, I'm talking to college students. If I'm going to be here for you and you're going to be here, we need to keep each other safe. And this is how we're going to do it. So th that's the only answer I can really give. 
Thanks for that. And, and please let me take a step back uh, before I ask the others. And, and I, I ask this not to be, um, you know, flippant, flippant about the, the question and, and certainly, you know, sensitive to the fact that there are um, varying opinions about this out there in, in the community and certainly in, in my work environment as well. And um, I ask it so that our audience can, can hear perhaps you know what what approaches or, or the others are pursuing to uh, encourage those who are not uh, vaccinated uh, to do so. So, uh, Julie, we'll we'll ask you next. Um, well, yeah, I, I think the um, the the question is real. I, I you've seen the news um, with. Uh, actually right here with Akron Children's and Metro and um, coming out with um, organizational mandates for employees, but CCF and UH um, not quite there on the mandate. There's lots of things on the forefront, one being a staffing crisis that's happening in organizations. Um, and just hearing employees say, you know, last year I was a hero, masked, gowned, and gloved, and that I was protecting you and you were protecting, you know, I was being protected by doing so, but now I need a mandated mask. I mean, a mandated vaccine, uh, even though I could still do the other things by protecting myself with mask, gown, and gloves. So I just, uh, I don't know that I have a good, but as an admin hat on, you ask yourself, you know, what is, what, what are our tools outside of what we've shared here? Um, and, and maybe Dr. File or Dr. Forbes, you have a better response. I have more, mine's more of the question than it is an answer. Uh, Dr. Forbes. Yeah, thanks. Boy, what a question. You know, um, I, I think that, so I, I have an approach, as you can imagine, there are people in healthcare, as you alluded to, who, who have not opted into taking the vaccine or, the, you know, it's kind of a complicated question, I guess. So the way I think about this and, and what I've shared with my own colleagues um, is I think you have to listen. You have to understand where it's coming from. And I'm going to hit the rewind button <clears throat> really, really hard and take you back to the early 80s when I was in medical school. In the early 80s, a new virus emerged in San Francisco. I'll never forget it. It was published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Review, which is like a bulletin that comes out of the CDC every week. And they described the case of cases uh, in San Francisco of young men <clears throat> with Kaposi sarcoma. It was very, very unusual. And they said, we don't know what this is, but it's a cluster, it's a pattern. We need to figure out what this is. Well, it turns out uh, all of those men uh, ultimately ended up, uh, or the, that was the harbinger of what would later become uh, HIV and AIDS. And that in my medical school years, I remember the controversy, the politicizing, the religious, the, the non-religious. There was so much drama around what to do, how to minimize transmission, who's the enemy, who's the victim. It was so confusing. And I thought to myself, I hope this never happens ever again. It took us years to figure out that you could still shake someone's hand if they have HIV. Um, it was a terrible time because I think what it did for me was it showed me that if you politicize public health, people die and you waste a lot of time and a lot of money. And so for that reason, for me, what I share with my colleagues is science, and this is just me echoing my, my chief quality officer, Dr. Bigham, science should be Switzerland. The data is the data. And when you oppose science because of a religious objection or because of your political angle, uh, you have to be careful because the science is what it is. You know, as, as one of our presidents has said, uh, you know, facts are stubborn things. Um, and we've watched, we've watched science play out over the last year. It's a little bit disappointing because the CDC would say one thing one month and then you'd hear something else the next month. And those of us who are scientists understand that science changes. We call that progress. The media <laughs> called it being wishy-washy and being unclear. You expect it to change as new data come in, science 
better change. That's how we get better. That's how we cure cancer and, and make things better. But what I say to my colleagues is I think in the end, if you opt out, it has to be an informed opt out. Please don't let it be political. Please don't let it be religious. I'll share a story recently. Someone shared that they, they were uh, gonna opt out of the COVID test for religious reasons. Now I said, COVID-19 is a disease that's never existed in the history of humanity. What is the basis of a religious objection to a disease that's never existed? And the person relented and then got tested. And my, my point is, if, if we politicize science and we confuse things like our emotions and all of that, then you end up with bad outcomes. And there are people who are dying due to misinformation. I think we have an opportunity to stop this thing. And I'm gonna sound like a broken record. We can absolutely stop the spread of this. We can turn this around. Or next year, we'll be having another webinar next August talking about a new variant that's better than anything we've ever seen. We've lost more loved ones. We're blaming everybody. Uh, we don't have to turn that way. And I think we have an opportunity now to do that. So to me, the message to those in healthcare who are opting out of the vaccine is to, I would ask them, why are you opting out? If it's, if it's a religious reason or a political reason, I would ask you to take another look at your motivation because in the end, Frankly, we can't lose any more people in healthcare, to be totally candid. Um, we can't afford to lose any more nurses, respiratory therapists, anybody, um, because we're in the middle of a pandemic and only 15% of the planet's vaccinated. So this is going to go on for a very, very, very long time. And so I, I think we have to do what we know to do that works and, and pray that God, by his grace, will, will get us all through this. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Hackenberg, any thoughts how you approach this? Well, I don't know how you top that explanation. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, but for me, it's just educate, educate and re-educate. And again, figure out what someone's motivation is for not wanting to. And just kind of not be critical or demeaning, but just be positive and educate and like, Dr. Forbes said, the science is the science and you, you keep letting them hear that until hopefully it kind of resonates and sits. But unfortunately, like many stories we hear, it's those people kind of have a change of heart when someone they know is affected uh, and at that point it's too late, so. Thanks. Yes. Tom? Yeah, I would just echo with what everybody said, I mean, you know, um, Dr. Forbes said, you know, listen, and I agree with that. Dr. Hackenberg said education, I agree with that. I, listen, as you know, at uh, SUMA, you know, we have uh, adopted the policy for mandating it as a condition, a condition of employment. Um, and so I've been spending probably two hours a day the last uh, two weeks just going around and trying to discuss with uh, employees uh, who are concerned about, uh, you know, getting the uh, vaccine and listening to them. And I agree, you can't be biased, you can't be committal. I mean, obviously I'm a champion for vaccines. If you look at the whole history of viruses with the exception probably of hepatitis C, the only way we've been able to control a viral infection is through uh, immunization. And, and look at how great it's been. I mean, when you consider measles and mumps and chickenpox, et cetera. But, um, uh, and so what I've, what I find is that you know you almost have to do it one on one, and I and I find that there's two groups of uh, persons. I mean, who have not been vaccinated. Those who we put into the category of those that are hesitant, but yet they're not anti-vaxxers because they'll get the influenza vaccine, they'll get other uh, vaccines, and they'll recommend for their children to get the the standard uh, childhood vaccines. I, I think the number one response I've had is that this is. A, a new vaccine and their concern about the safety. Well, I think the fact that now it's been approved, at least for those over the age of 16, helps uh, assure them that this is a uh, safe vaccine uh, and that it is very uh, effective. I mean, to be 90, 95% effective is just tremendously beneficial. And, and the only way we're gonna get out of this, and this has already been mentioned several times, uh, is for a high percentage to be uh, immunized. So I consider it from the standpoint of the community uh, of the population, 
almost a civic responsibility. We all have it to our to, to be responsible to help protect the uh, the health of everybody else in the community. And one way to do that is everybody get infected. I mean, everybody get vaccinated. I suppose if everybody got infected, that would be one way, and that would be uh, another way of getting immunity. But we don't want that because we know it's going to happen uh, in, in the hospital. Then there's the other group that are anti-vaxxers, and it's very difficult uh, to discuss with them. Um, uh, another uh, group that I find very common is because a lot of our healthcare professionals are women of childbearing age, and they may be pregnant. And we do allow that as a deferment, that if they're pregnant, uh, we do allow them to uh, delay until they deliver. However, when uh, a, a pregnant woman tells me that, I try whatever I can to convince them for their sake, for their baby's sake, to get immunized. Because I go back to the pandemic in 2009, 2010, of the H1N1 influenza uh, pandemic, when then only about 25% of pregnant women were vaccinated. Probably the number one risk factor for death at that time was a uh, pregnant woman. It was uh, 16 times more likely to die if they weren't uh, vaccinated, if they develop H1N1 um, influenza than if they were vaccinated. The same thing is with COVID-19. Now there's increasing information that one of the biggest risk factors for serious complication, and remember if the mother doesn't do well, the baby's not gonna do well, is pregnancy. So uh, our OBGYN department is very aggressive at trying to recommend to all of the pregnant women that not only for their benefit, but for the benefit of the uh, baby. And all the studies now have been showing this. There's randomized clinical trials. Uh, there's uh, this V-safe uh, program that follows the surveillance of people who have been uh, vaccinated then become pregnant uh, or are pregnant and then vaccinated uh, to find that there's no difference in side effects or adverse events uh, in those who are, are uh, vaccinated versus not in pregnancy. So uh, again, it just goes back to uh, being open, being transparent, not being, um, you know, biased, uh, listening to those that have a concern, and then addressing those concerns with education. And we find that, at least for a high percentage uh, of those that have not received the vaccine, that they've gone ahead and, and received it. Well, well, thank you all for, for that particular uh, the answers to the, that particular question, because I think that that advice is something that our audience could probably take even outside our healthcare uh, colleagues who, for reason or, or another, we have uh, time for a couple of more questions that had come in. And um, Dr. Forbes, this question is for you. Of the vaccinated patients getting sick with COVID, um, are, are ones that receive one vaccine over the other um, sicker? Is that something that you're seeing? It's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. Um, you know, in, in the hospital, I, I can't say we've seen any breakthrough infections in patients. Um, we may have had a handful of breakthrough cases in employees, I'm not sure, as adults. But for children, we have not seen any breakthrough cases in in the young people yet, so I don't know. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Fowle, maybe? Well, no, we have not uh, been able to differentiate uh, the breakthrough cases based no. on vaccine. I think Pfizer and Moderna are virtually the same when you look at the clinical data. And quite honestly, the J&J &J only represents 10% of all of those in the United States that have been vaccinated. So it's really a small sample size compared to the others. But mm -hmm. anecdotally, we have not seen any, any difference. Yeah. And breakthrough. The, the breakthrough cases. Question for Dr. File. Um, the pros and cons with using in-home tests for Delta, the Delta variant, the reliability of tests, costs, and recommended brands, turnaround time for results. Well, the turnaround time for those, uh, those home uh, tests is very quick. I mean, it's literally 15 minutes. It's sort of like doing a, a pregnancy test. Um, the, the difference is uh, they're not quite as sensitive, but they're still pretty good. I mean, they're probably within 85, 90% uh, sensitivity compared to uh, the, the standard laboratory tests that would be done, the, the molecular uh, tests. Uh, but those home tests you have to pay for. I mean, uh, in the average uh, uh, 
uh, test uh, is, as far as I understand, about $24, uh, $25. And what's recommended, because the sensitivity is not quite as high, is that you do two tests uh, to, to give you uh, the equivalent uh, uh, quality measures as you would with uh, one of the molecular or lab-based uh, tests. So they recommend that you do one and then maybe another, a second one about two or three days later to make sure. These are called antigen tests versus the uh, uh, molecular tests. Now, um, the molecular tests take a little bit longer. Uh, you can go to many different sites. I mean, you can go to the website. I mean, you can go to ODH, you can go to um, the CDC website, even the Summit County, and you can find places where you can get these tests. Uh, and you shouldn't have to pay for them because this is paid for by uh, the, the government uh, when you go through these molecular tests that are going to, uh, to the labs. Um, the molecular tests are 95% accurate. Uh, the home kit's probably 85 to 90% accurate. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and at this point, we've uh, reached the end of the seminar. This has been an informative session for sure. Once again, many thanks to our panel of experts, Dr. Constantinou, Dr. Tsurambides, Dr. File, Dr. Hackenberg, uh, Dr. Forbes, and of course, uh, uh, Father Jerry, we hope that uh, the session has been informative for you as well, the audience, and we certainly appreciate you tuning in. And many thanks to those of you who submitted questions. We, we always find that when we have questions from you, the audience, uh, these uh, tend to be even more informative as we engage our panelists. And so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, turn uh, back over to Father Jerry for a closing uh, prayer this evening. Hey, thank you all for coming. Thank you as, as well for Costa for leading this uh, this evening, doing an outstanding job, and to to everyone who contributed. It was uh, really a very informative evening. So thank you so much. Um, we ask as we close in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God, we ask your blessings upon us that you continue to grant us health and protect us, protect our children and illumine our minds and our hearts to listen to one another and to help one another through this difficult and challenging time so that we may find um, health and cooperation with one another for the glory of your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Take care and good night. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. All right.